Okay, in this section we're going to look at the definite integral. Now we looked at an indefinite integral in a previous recording. Remember we have this integral sign. This is the lower limit of integration and the upper limit of integration. Okay, so a lot of this looks the same except for these two limits. And what we're doing is we're finding the integral of f from a to b. Okay, so when you find the value of the integral, you have actually evaluated the integral. So that's what we're going to look at. How do we evaluate integrals? Now, a continuous function is integrable. That is, if a function f is continuous on an interval from a to b, then its definite integral over a to b exists. Now here are some rules, and we'll look back to these rules. But the order of integration, if I have the integral from b to a of f of x, and that's the opposite of the integral from a to b. The integral from a to a actually has a zero width, so its integral is zero. The constant multiple tells me that the integral from a to b of k times f of x dx is k times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. And the second part there is just a special case where uh, k is negative 1. The sums of the integrals and differences of the integrals are equal to uh, the individual integrals added or subtracted. If we add an integral from a to b to an integral from b to c of the same function, then that's the same as the integral from a to c of the function. Then there's a maximum minimum inequality. And basically, you'll see on the next slide, what it's saying is if we take the smallest value of f times the um, width of this uh, integral, this will make a rectangle here and a rectangle with the largest value. And the integral is going to be somewhere in between those two. If f of x is greater than or equal to g of x on an integral, then the integral from or on an interval, the integral from a to b of f of x to d of x is going to be dx is going to be greater than or equal to the integral from a to b of g of x dx. Now it helps to see some pictures. First, that zero width interval. What we're actually finding when we're doing these integrals are areas under a graph. So if I'm only going from a to a, then I have an inter uh, um, a area with the width of zero. So this is going to have zero area under that graph. The constant multiple says is I ha if I have something like y equals f of x and y equals 2 times f of x, then the area under the curve is just twice as much. This says if I take the integral of f of x and the integral of g of x and I add them together, I get this new integral. Okay, so if you take the green area plus this pink area all the way down, add them together, you get this part blue area all the way down. The additive, additivity property says if I go from A to B and from B to C, then that's the same as going from A to C. The max min inequality says if you have a minimum value of your function and you make a rectangle, then that area is going to be smaller than the area actually under the curve. If I take the highest value and I make a rectangle, then that area is going to be larger than the actual area under the curve. And domination tells us is if f of x is greater than g of x everywhere, then the area under f of x has to be greater than the area under g of x. Now let's use some of the properties that we just found here. Now we are given these integrals that we know the values for. If I want to know the integral from 1 or from 4 to 1, I know the integral from 1 to 4. If you look back, the order of integration says if I switch these limits, then it's going to be the opposite integral. So this will be the opposite of the integral from 1 to 4 of f of x dx. Well, the integral from 1 to 4 of f of x dx was negative 2, and the opposite of negative 2 then would be 2. Now this is a combination of the sum rule and the constant multiple rules. I have 2 times f of x plus 3 times h of x. I know the integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x and the integral from negative 1 to 1 of h of x. Remember that the constant multiple rule said we could just bring the constant to the front. The sum rule said I can break it into two individual sums. So if I apply both of those, then this is 2 times the integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x dx plus 3 times the integral from negative 1 to 1 of h of x dx. 
So this is 2 times the integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x dx is 5, plus 3 times the integral from negative 1 to 1 of h of x is 7, which is 10 plus 21, or 31. So this integral would be 31. Now look at the last one example there. We're going to go from negative 1 to 4. Now we have the integral from negative 1 to 1 and the integral from 1 to 4. Well then, we have this rule, this additivity rule, that says the integral from a to b plus the integral from b to c is the same as the integral from a to c. So that means this is the same as the integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x dx plus the integral from 1 to 4 of f of x dx. And so we're just breaking it apart into two separate areas here. The first area is 5, and the second area is negative 2. 5 plus negative 2 gives us 3. Now if y equals f of x is non-negative and integrable over a closed interval from a to b, then the area under the curve y equals f of x over a to b is the integral of f from a to b. Okay, so the area is the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Now here are some formulas that will help us as we want to go through and find some of these areas. If we have the integral from a to b of x dx, that's b squared over 2 minus a squared over 2. If we have the integral from a to b of c dx, that's c times b minus a, and the integral from a to b of x squared dx is b cubed over 3 minus a cubed over 3. And notice with these, a is less than b. Now let's take this um, picture here because it's easy for us to find the area of this rectangle. Area, or not rectangle, I'm sorry, triangle. Area, we know, is 1 half base times height. Okay, for this particular case, our base is B and our height is B. So this is 1 half B squared. Okay, now we know that is our or that is our area of this blue region. Now, what we're looking at here is this is the integral from 0 to B of X DX. That's what we're finding here. We're going from 0 to B, and we're looking at the area under the graph of X. Okay? Now, let's go back and let's look at the formula. The formula was we've got from A to B, B squared over 2 minus A squared over 2. So in our case, A is going to be 0. So that will give us B squared over 2 minus, instead of A, we have 0, so 0 squared over 2. 0 squared over 2 is 0, so we have B squared over 2. Well, we knew from using our formulas that that area is 1 half b squared, which is also b squared over 2. So we're looking at this example because it's real easy to actually compute the area out by hand. Now here's another one that's fairly easy to compute the area by hand. It's almost the same picture, except now we are actually starting at A and we're actually going to B. Okay? And we said just a minute ago the area would be the integral from a to b of x, f of x. I'm sorry, wrote that all wrong. Let me just start over. The integral from a to b of f of x, dx. And we said that integral then from a to b, and our f of x is x, would be b squared over 2 minus a squared over 2. So we know that According to the integral properties, this is what the area should be of that piece. Now that is actually a trapezoid, okay? Remember the area for a trapezoid is one half your height times base one plus base two, okay? Now in this case, our bases are the A and the B. Those are the bases. And the height is this. The height is b minus a. Okay? So the height is b minus a times our bases, which are b plus a. Now looking at this, you should recognize the difference of squares here. This is going to be b squared plus a b minus a b minus a squared is b squared minus a squared. 
1 half times b squared is b squared over 2. 1 half times a squared is a squared over 2. So using our trapezoid formula, we know that that's the area. We use our integral formula, we also find the exact same area. Now the last thing we want to look at here is average value. We've talked a little bit about average value. Remember with average value we did 1 over b minus a, which is the width of the interval, times the area. Well now we're calling the area the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to look at um, in the interval from say a to b. We're going to take and find that area, and in this case we've got area here, and we've got area here. If we knew that area, we could just say 1 over b minus a times that area, and that will give us the average value of that function. Now let's take this example because it would be really easy for us to find the area. Okay, here we have a semicircle. We know the area of a circle is pi r squared, so the area of our semicircle is going to be half of that, half pi r squared, because we've got half of a circle. Okay, now the uh, radius of this circle is obviously 2, so that's 1 half times pi times 2 squared, 1 half times pi times 4 is 2 pi. So the area under this curve is 2 pi square units. And again, we have a, a, something that we can easily find the area of. Okay. Now that means that the integral from negative 2 to 2 of the square root of 4 minus x squared dx is actually 2 pi, because that's the area from negative 2 to 2 under this graph. Okay. Now let's say we want to find the average value. In order to find the average value, we're going to do that formula we just looked at, 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So this is going to be 1 over 2 minus negative 2. This actually has a width of 4 times our area, which is 2 pi. Well, that's 2 minus negative 2 is 2 plus 2 or 4 cancel here, and that's pi over 2. So the average value here of this graph is pi over 2. And you can see the pi over 2 there, and that's the average value of that graph.